Well, welcome everybody. My name is Lisa Klein. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, and I'm happy to be your moderator here tonight. Thank you for coming. On behalf of the Tri Campus Planning Committee, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event. Supporting Afghan evacuees, it's a panel discussion tonight. So first we wanna go over a couple of logistics. This event is being live streamed and recorded. So you can find the recording on Viterbo's website at the end of um, tonight's presentation, if you'd like to revisit it or share it with others in the community to help share what we all learn here. Western is also hosting a viewing of tonight's presentation on their campus in Toma. So we would like to send a warm welcome to our guests who are watching tonight's presentation in Toma tonight as well. Now the format today, our presenters are gonna start this evening by introducing themselves. Um, and they're also gonna get a set of predetermined questions to help answer the questions and address the focus of tonight's discussion, which is who are the Afghan people, why they are in the United States and how we can help. Then we will open it up to conversation and questions from the audience. You probably saw a little card on all of your seats. You're welcome to write a question down on that card. Those cards and directions for how those cards will be collected will be given after the panelists speak. In Toma, you can work with your hosts um, in that, at that site to help get your questions delivered to me here in La Crosse. So we're gonna begin, and we'd like to begin by having each of our panelists introduce themselves. We're gonna start with Lieutenant Colonel Eric Archer. After you introduce yourself, sir. Um, panelists, you can just go one by one right down and introduce yourself, three to five minutes, your name, your title, and a little bit about what you're gonna be presenting to today's audience. I have to hit the right button. Good evening. Um, my name's Eric, I'm a soldier. I've been in the army for 21 years now, and I've deployed four times, twice to Afghanistan and twice to Iraq. I'm a military police officer by trade. Um, I spent five years in Germany and then was blessed to be at Fort Carson, Colorado for a few years and then spent time also at Missouri. Um, not as blessed, just to throw that out there. <laughs> um, and then we've been to Kentucky. We've been pretty much all over the world. The last assignment before here, I worked in the National Military Command Center at the Pentagon, where I was fortunate enough to help write some national level Secretary of Defense op orders to uh, move forces around in Africa. And that was just an incredible job. I now here am the professor of military science at the University of Wisconsin-La Crosse which also has responsibility for Viterbo and Winona, and that job's amazing in that we create and, and teach the, the next generation of leaders in the Army. Um, I was picked up for command in Louisiana, but I arrived here and decided no, and dropped my packet to retire right here. This, uh, this is an amazing community, um, an amazing location, and one we very proudly call home. So I'm fortunate to be with you guys tonight, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Beth. I am. I work with MWR out at Fort McCoy, and tonight I'm going to talk to you about what we are, the activities that we are doing out there. Thank you. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Anthony Tragoski, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at the University of Wisconsin, La Crosse. It's a real honor for me to be on such a distinguished panel and to be just a small part of the efforts to show how welcoming Western Wisconsin is. I'm here to comment on the political and governance and economic angles of this issue. And, and there are certainly many of those angles to, to address. As a political scientist, I'm highly attentive to political and social movements. And I, I pay close attention to how people mobilize to support social causes. So fr from that perspective, I've been just so amazed to see the remarkable coordination and mobilization by, by so many in our community. Of course, the rapid evacuations from Afghanistan called for rapid mobilization here in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, and that makes the local efforts all the more important and all the more impressive. Of course, political scientists will be quick to point out the numerous barriers that exist to coordinating and mobilizing around a cause. 
Uh, there are so many people in our community who should be commended for overcoming these obstacles and hurdles and quickly assembling and scaling up efforts to, to help the Afghan evacuees. On a final note, just a few minutes before coming here tonight, I spoke with someone who said, I don't have any money to contribute. Finances are tight for me, but I still want to help. What can I do to help? And that was just so inspiring to me and so indicative of the big hearts that people in our community have for the evacuees. People want to help. They want to understand. And that's exactly why we're here tonight. So thank you to everyone for your interest in this event. And I look forward to the discussion. Good evening. My name is uh, Roberto Parteru. I'm the executive director of Catholic Charities. And our role, uh, it's primarily to help and assist all the refugees. And uh, I'm here to speak about the role of Catholic Charities and working together with, uh, uh, with Beth and also with uh, uh, the USCCB, the, the, the Conference of Bishop, the Bishop's Conference. So I'm here to represent them and speak to you about what we actually do. And, and we're very uh, honored to be here. Thank you and good evening, everyone. My name is Holly Kirking Loomis and I am an American diplomat. I am also a graduate of Sparta High School. And in fact, my senior year of high school, I attended UWL part-time. So it's nice to be home. Um, in my career, I've served around the world in our embassies in Beijing, in Caracas, Tegucigalpa, and most recently now in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And when I learned that the State Department would play a leading role with the US government and the military and the nonprofit organizations in hosting Afghan arrivals here in Western Wisconsin, I volunteered and was grateful for the opportunity to join that effort. The State Department is overseeing the process of resettlement of the Afghan guests, both here in Wisconsin, as well as through 46 other states in the United States. Our Afghan guests are um, not only here in Fort McCoy and in Western Wisconsin, but across the US at military bases uh, from the East Coast to, to the Southwest and uh, a number of places in between. Tonight, what I'd like to share with you are a couple of reflections on my five weeks um, working here in Wisconsin uh, alongside my embassy Kabul Afghan colleagues who were evacuated as part of that effort. And I'd like to talk a bit about the resettlement effort and how you can help. If you don't have money to give, there are important other ways that each and every one of us can welcome Afghan people, students, colleagues, uh, and neighbors into our communities. Thank you. Thank you all. We're going to start with our first set of questions. These questions are going to be for Lieutenant Colonel Eric Archer. How do you view the situation in Afghanistan and the refugees as a soldier who fought in that country? So I guess I would first say that I'm not a representative of Fort McCoy or, or the Army. I'm speaking to you tonight in my personal capacity as a soldier and as Eric. Um, I think many of us have had something in our lives that we sacrificed so much for, that it felt like it was um, ourselves, we ourselves were invested in the effort. Um, when we're successful, that result is, is joy, it's accomplishment. And when we're not, we feel like part of our, our soul has been lost. Um, in terms of Afghanistan, a lot of my peers and I, we ache, we hurt, um, we sacrificed much there, um, you know, in terms of time, in terms of dollars and, and lives. Um, I heard that we didn't leave Afghanistan much better than we left it. Um, I, I ache for the people that are still there. Um, but I'll tell you inside of that, and that's a, that's a hard feeling to, to have. And the first couple of weeks, especially after that evacuation and, and after the situation unfolded as it did, were troubling times for a great many of us. But I've seen greatness too. And I've seen greatness in the soldiers, um, the men and women that serve there. Of course, the diplomats that have been there as well. It's a whole of government effort. And those young men and women um, protected uh, a people. They guarded a people. Um, they don't care about policy or politics. And, and they're the age of many of the folks in this room um, transplanted to a country that they've never been to in a situation that's deadly and dangerous. And in those moments, I think they found um, the best versions of themselves. So I do regret that the outcome was maybe not more favorable um, you know, personally and maybe selfishly, but I'm very, very proud of, of the effort that was put in. 
I'll tell you though, as it relates to our, our Afghan refugees, um, it's much more poignant, right? It'd be easy for me to focus, I think, on, on my lens of Afghanistan, but really that's kind of secondary to, to who we're talking about tonight, and that's our Afghan guests, the refugees. So I think what I would like you to do, if we could do a little thought experiment maybe, is imagine your home, right? Like the smell when you walk in, and the Thanksgiving dinners, the holiday traditions, the partner, the pet, or the site that greets you every day as you open the door. And I want you just to picture that for a minute. This is called home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. The boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his whole body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of doing until the blade burnt threats into your neck. And even then, you carried the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in an airport toilet, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear you wouldn't be going back. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the stomach of a truck feeding on a newspaper unless the miles traveled mean something more than the journey. No one crawls under fences. No one wants to be beaten, pitied. No one chooses refugee camps, no one strip searches, no or strip searches where your body's left aching, or prison because prison's safer than a city of fire. And one prison guard in the night is better than a truckload of men who look like your father. No one could take it, no one could stomach it, no one skin would be tough enough. The go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry, they smell strange, savage, messed up our country, and now they want to mess ours up. How do the words, the dirty looks, roll off your backs? Well, maybe because the blow is softer than a limb torn off, or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs, or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body in pieces. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun, and no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore, unless home told you to quicken your legs, leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through the oceans, Drown, save, be hungry, beg, forget pride. Your survival's more important. No one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. So that's a poem by Warson Shire. And I guess the question to answer, like, how do I view refugees? I review them as heroes. The situation that they're leaving is incredibly disastrous. My worst day in Afghanistan was the best there. I came home every night to a safe fob. And the danger that I still feel now is, is ever present. And many of us, mental health issues that we have are just from moments in time in a country that is their home. So you'll see soldiers in pictures at Fort McCoy, I think, feel love like they feel empathy they they just want to help and make their life better because we understand a bit of it so the situation in afghanistan uh the refugees i i am thrilled for our community's outpouring of love and assistance for them and i'm proud to be a part of it thank you our next question what did you learn about the afghan people during your two deployments to afghanistan that's interesting too so you know i really what special standing do I have? Because I, I, I put feet in Afghanistan twice. Um, sometimes I think we think that confers some authority or some special knowledge and it doesn't. But what I would tell you is in my experience, um, we're all people. I think one of the great things the army taught me, which is maybe unique given our mission and our purpose yeah. is that there's a great commonality among all of us. My first deployment in Afghanistan, um, there was a, a girl of probably 10 and she didn't have any parents next to our police station and she was looking out for her very young brother and sister and so you know I talked to my mom and as moms do you know she sent a whole package of things right the whole Catholic church there St. Joe's in Libertyville rallied and sent boxes and one of the first things we got was uh, crayons and you know one of the pictures I have from that deployment is is this everything in Iraq is tan so there's this tan brick wall and concertina wire, you know, razor wire above it. And there's us on one side with all of our armor and our helmets. And there's these children on the other side. And, and we're both standing on milk crates to try to like reach. And so I reach over and I hand them crayons. And, you know, I'm pretty excited that we got them crayons. Like this is gonna be a pretty awesome moment for them. Like they're gonna color and, and nothing in their world has color. Like it's just sand and dust and dirt. And they promptly looked at those crayons and started eating them. <laughs> so I realized 
that they've never seen crayons in their whole life. Like in their whole life, they'd never seen a crayon. So what I've learned through my deployments about, I mean, the Afghan people personally are, are tribal and they're powerful and they have a strong sense of pride, which I would tell you then, if we imagine what it's like to be a father who can no longer provide for their family, you know, reliant upon the grace and gratitude of others, that would be hard. It's especially hard in that culture for their families to be dislocated and put in a country that they don't speak the language they've, they've never been to would be traumatic for us. It is especially so for them. But as a people, the great thing the army taught me is we are all the same. Like the, the Afghan um, Eric is the same as the American Eric. So I learned uh, a great commonality, I think, of, about us as people. Why should our local communities provide help to the Afghan people when we have issues of food insecurity and homelessness within our own city limits? Another good question. Um, I just say that because I wrote these three, so I'm going to say the questions are all really good. Um, so the issue there, I would tell us, like, look, I'm a publicly educated history major, and like, that's a false choice. We can do both things. You'll see a lot of times in narratives and on those damn social media pages, you know, this kind of exact sentiment is why aren't we helping folks locally? And I'll tell you, as a, as a soldier, I feel keenly the plight of homeless veterans, uh, the mental health crisis among veterans, food insecurity. I had a conversation tonight about a veteran that's you know, having food insecurity and mental health problems. It's, it's terrible. These folks that have given so much and now are so alone, but we can do both things. There's not a, it's not a zero sum game, the, the love and sense of community that we have. Um, absolutely. And I can tell you as a soldier, because I've had fellow soldiers ask me, why is this important to you? Like, this is a political issue. Why are we involved in this as veterans? Why are we involved in this as soldiers? And that line of thinking is just, I, I can't comprehend it. I want to understand what people think. I can't understand that because what we are supposed to do is care for each other, not from a religious point of view or, or anything else other than we're on this thing together. So I want to take care of veterans. I want to take care of the community and we should rally to do that. But I know that we are too. Like there are amazing organizations in this community that do that. These folks though, just arrived from another country where violence is their only known entity every day. And we have an opportunity to change their lives. I feel like that's a baton being given to us and, and we're being challenged to say, how can we help? Because our, our country is founded on that, right? The pursuit of the American dream of a better life. We were all there once and they're there now. Um, I would challenge us and not the people in this room, obviously, but those listening and those that are trying to find a way like the gentleman you talked to or the lady you talked to, we can help and we should. Thank you very much. This next set of question, questions goes to Holly Kirking Loomis from the State Department. Who are our guests at Fort McCoy? Our guests at Fort McCoy are my peers. They are my colleagues from the embassy. They are the interpreters who helped you understand the lay of the land in Afghanistan. They are people who worked to support our diplomatic and our development and our military efforts in Afghanistan over a generation. And they're also the people who believed in the American dream and worked to create it in their country. And that's the reason that they're vulnerable now. Um, every day, we take walks in the neighborhood to reconnect with the reason we're there and get a chance to speak with who our guests are. And I would say that most of them are children, they're families, they're the people who supported us, they're the people who um, are us, who worked for the US government just with a different passport in a different country. And so they're mostly children, they're kids who see an army soldier standing between two orange barricades and they see a goalie. And so that soldier is there like blocking soccer balls uh, during the day. There are ladies who are out taking walks in late summer in Wisconsin, which is a glorious time to arrive in Wisconsin. There are men carrying back boxes of pizza uh, to take to their families because as one boy said, when am I gonna get to Wisconsin? When, or when am I gonna get to the United States? And his dad said, well, you're already here. He said, the kid said, no, 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 the, the United States where they eat pizza. And so we're going through pizzas like you can't believe because it's the first introduction to America. Um, the, the guests at Fort McCoy are our colleagues. They're our friends. They're the people who shared our values. Uh, they're women who worked to build over 20 years, every aspect of inclusion of women in Afghanistan, Afghanistan society. Um, we have teachers who worked in education, who educated girls, who started schools that educated boys and girls. They've seen those schools shut down. 
They are members of the government. They're candidates for elected office. Um, and I'll just say on a personal note, um, you know, I've spent my career working for the U.S. Embassy as a diplomat in, in embassies and consulates around the world. And, you know, when you arrive in a foreign country as a foreigner, you learn to depend on the people who help you, the ones who help you get your kids registered in school, the ones who help you orient yourself culturally in, in language as well. They're the ones who are responsible to keep you safe and your family safe and your colleagues safe. And so I come to this question with a very clear answer that the people who have arrived at Fort McCoy are our colleagues and our peers and our friends and people who share the same dreams that we have. Um, and who as a result of pursuing those dreams and building that society in their own country uh, had to flee because they're at risk. Thank you. Holly, what does the timeline and process look like for our guests? It's a great question. So the State Department um, is just one of a number of organizations at Fort McCoy. Um, so first, the U.S. Army has the garrison who are always at Fort McCoy, as well as uh, the civilians who work at Fort McCoy. And they've done a tremendous job of building a town of 14,000 or 15,000 when you include all of the respondents to the effort in the middle of Monroe County. It's by far the largest town in Monroe County. It's about the size of Chippewa Falls. And so that's a pretty tremendous effort. So we've moved through the phase where we received uh, thousands of people over a number of days and provided through help of the Red Cross, Project Rubicon and others um, and the military for the kind of essentials that they needed for sustainment, um, for, for food, a bed, shelter. And now we're also uh, arriving at the point where we're looking towards resettlement, which is the State Department's role in, um, in the uh, operation. So there are nine resettlement agencies across the United States. They all work with local affiliates, including some here in La Crosse, that uh, in normal times receive refugees and resettle refugees from around the world. And in this instance, our, it's the same system that will help to resettle our Afghan arrivals. The timeline takes a different amount of time depending upon who you are, who your family is, what your profile and your needs are. So when guests first started to arrive, we had among our guests, American citizens or lawful permanent residents of the United States who already have a home and a job and, and a life in America. And they left very quickly. They were able to go home. Um, you know, on the other far end of the spectrum, the community is really diverse at Fort McCoy. And so we've got both people who are vice ministers, but we also have people who worked as cooks on a far flung forward operating base in 2010, who may not um, even be um, educated in their own language and sort of everybody in between. Those people will take a little bit more time in some instances to resettle. They don't have a community, a, 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 a connection in the United States and they're gonna need more support to get their kids in school, to apply for jobs, to find affordable housing. And then you've got a group in between. Um, so at Fort McCoy right now, we're handling all of the refugee processing that in a normal scenario would happen outside of the United States. And we're doing that on Fort McCoy. That means we're doing biometrics, we're doing health certifications, we're receiving applications for work permits. And so all of those processes will take time and as people complete them, they'll move into the resettlement phase where first we'll uh, learn about their ties, we'll learn about their skills and their, their dreams. And at the other side, those nine resettlement agencies and their local affiliates will, um, will accept uh, families to resettle in their communities. And it's called the assurance process. This, that means that those communities, those neighborhoods, those local organizations can assure that they can sponsor that family. And um, right now we're in the process of building out that system to be able to accommodate the number of people we've received in a relatively short amount of time. So Fort McCoy is a temporary home for our Afghan guests. Some people have already begun the process to move. Others are at various stages of their um, processing on base. And simultaneously we're working, we're interviewing them and helping to connect them with communities across the United States that are prepared to provide all of the services uh, for their particular circumstances. And Holly, how can our communities, these people here, how can we help? 
I'm so glad you asked. Um, So first, I um, when I learned that Fort McCoy was going to host guests, I wanted to come back and be a part of this, not only because of my professional connection with our guests, um, but something that I felt very personally. I feel that I've welcomed people to my home, and I have been really moved by the generosity, including of many people in this room, in terms of providing the essentials that people need to sustain life. And you don't even know these people. It's incredible. And that generosity has been overwhelming. The armory in Sparta, Wisconsin is filled to the brim. They need volunteers to help sort things. So I see uh, Team Rubicon is here tonight with Marsha. If someone's interested in volunteering, you know, now it doesn't cost money to go to the Sparta armory and sort clothing. Over time, there are other opportunities though to contribute beyond um, donations and sorting and kind of that kind of work. Um, The resettlement system in the United States depends upon community sponsors and hosts and people who help welcome new neighbors to their neighborhood. And so if you're thinking about the way you or your family can help, there's a website, welcome.us, and it's become a centralized location to put forward offers of what it is that you have to give. It doesn't have to be money. It could be sponsorship. It could be neighborhood welcome. It could be whatever it is that you're Uh, family, your organization, um, or your community has to offer to Afghan people who are arriving in that community. Welcome.us. Thank you so much. Our next set of questions goes to political scientist Anthony Trogoski. Anthony, what was the series of events that led up to the evacuations from Afghanistan and the relocation of so many people to Fort McCoy? It's a long story. I'll pick up the story in 2019. Uh, That was when the American government and the Taliban were engaged in negotiations for an American exit from Afghanistan. And in February of 2020, the American government and the Taliban had reached an agreement calling for American troops to withdraw from Afghanistan by May of 2021. And as part of that agreement, the Taliban would cease attacks against US forces and cease their ties with Al Qaeda. And after taking office, President Biden said he would continue with this agreement that was negotiated by the Trump administration. He did move the date for withdrawal to August 31st, 2021. Now, throughout the summer of 2021, the Taliban rapidly gained ground and territory from the Afghan government. And the speed of the Taliban advances came as a surprise to officials in Washington, D.C. The U.S. backed Afghan government really collapsed much faster than those in the intelligence community had anticipated. So the Taliban sweep into Kabul on August 15th, while the U.S. maintains control of the Kabul airport in order to facilitate evacuations from Afghanistan. It was a precarious and and deadly situation. Ultimately, thousands of Afghans who worked with the United States government were evacuated as the Afghan government collapsed and the, the Taliban swept back into power. And so I think the point of going through this history is not to play Monday morning quarterback or to play armchair general. I I think the point is to illustrate the chaos and the trauma that have surrounded the lives of our new Afghan neighbors, the tremendous uncertainty and instability that they have experienced, their sudden exit from Afghanistan as the government collapsed. And so, Lisa, this context matters, and this context, I think, should cause us to feel significant compassion for our new Afghan neighbors. Thank you. What has been the response of the American people to the arrival of the evacuees? It's been quite positive. Um, there have been multiple surveys done, multiple wordings of questions, and they typically find between 60 to the high 80s in terms of the percentage of Americans who support the arrival of the Afghan evacuees. So when I piece the data on public opinion together, there is strong evidence that the American public is highly supportive of the evacuees. Um, Now, when you add in information and details, like the vetting process, when people learn about the vetting process, when they learn about the roles that the evacuees played, then support for accepting the evacuees just absolutely skyrockets. And you get 
importantly, strong bipartisan support for the evacuees, strong, overwhelming majorities of Democrats and Republicans alike. Of course, there are going to be loud voices in this discussion that do spread rumors and toss aside norms of civility. And social media and cable television provide these folks platforms that maybe they didn't have in the past. Um, so I was not surprised to see false and misleading information being spread about the evacuees. Um, I think you had well-intentioned people who were curious and wanted information about the situation at Fort McCoy, but just couldn't find any. And the rumor mill filled the informational void, I, I think. But now that new information is coming about, we see images coming out, we see stories emerging from Fort McCoy, public support for evacuees appears to be quite strong. So the court of public opinion matters a lot here. And, and I do think that we should continue monitoring it. Thank you. Now, how will the rhetoric and the actions of American political leaders affect the situation surrounding the evacuees? It's gonna have an enormous effect um, because people's attitudes about politics come from a variety of places. But the public's political attitudes are greatly shaped by the rhetoric and the actions of political leaders, greatly shaped. So when forming opinions, people take cues from political leaders, most notably the political leaders from their preferred political party. Um, so if political leaders speak negatively of the evacuees or take actions that are hostile towards the evacuees, then that is going to trickle down, so to speak, uh, to the level of the general public and people will adjust their opinions in response to the rhetoric and the actions of political leaders. I, I think one of the most important things to me is distinguishing this situation surrounding the Afghan evacuees from the more general partisan debate surrounding immigration, because there's intense polarization on the issue of immigration. There's a profound public divide on the issue of immigration between the two parties. My great concern is that the conversation about Afghan evacuees gets sort of folded in to the broader rhetoric and debate over immigration. And I've seen that happening on cable news and the internet a bit, and it really does concern me. If the situation with the Afghan evacuees gets folded into the broader debate over immigration, then the country could rapidly divide and polarize over the issue of the evacuees. Now, as long as political leaders in their rhetoric and actions treat the Afghan evacuee situation as being a distinct issue, an issue that must be considered on its own terms, then I think we'll continue to see strong bipartisan support for the Afghan evacuees. But this is something I'm watching closely. What kinds of effects would we expect refugees to have in the United States economically and in other ways? Enormously positive ones. Um, in 2017, the United States Department of Health and Human Services produced a report that examined the economic impact of refugees from 2005 to 2014. Refugees contributed $63 billion more to government revenues compared to the cost of the public services that they used. So in other words, I mean, you could say that refugees made money for the US government during that time period. Um, you know, to me, that's simply extraordinary. You, you have people who are coming to the United States with nothing, and they quickly make a positive economic impact here in the United States. Uh, as a matter of fact, between 2009 and 2011, the Nonpartisan Migration Policy Institute found that workforce participation among refugees was higher than workforce participation of people born in the United States. Um, so there's strong evidence that the incomes of refugees grow considerably the longer they're in the United States. After 10 years of residence, the incomes and employment status of refugees are similar to the people uh, who were born in the United States after just 10 years in, in the United States. Um, so there's a lot of misinformation out there about how refugees receive extravagant levels of public assistance. In, in reality, refugees provide tremendous economic benefit to the United States. Um, so I think it's important to correct that misperception that refugees are, are, are somehow taking more in government assistance than they're contributing. In fact, that is the exact opposite of the case. And refugees have an enormously positive economic impact on the United States. Thank you. And what does the situation say about the current political environment, both here in our community 
and in the nation. I think it says that bipartisanship is not quite dead yet. Um, of course, there's a lot of partisanship surrounding the situation in Afghanistan, but the partisanship surrounding Afghanistan mainly involves the strategic moves made by multiple administrations and the outcomes of those moves. The partisanship surrounding the Afghan evacuees has been much more muted. As I mentioned, strong bipartisan support in poll after poll after poll for Afghan evacuees. As for our community, I just think back to that person who told me, I don't have money to give, but I care and I want to help. And so my hope is that we can maintain that united front as a community, a community with full hearts and a compassionate spirit. Thank you, Anthony. We're gonna move on to Catholic Charities, Roberto um, Parturu. Roberto, what is Catholic Charities Diocese of La Crosse role in welcoming the Afghan refugees at Fort McCoy? Primarily our role is to help the refugees and we coordinate by bringing the volunteers, we coordinate all the volunteers that uh, assist. We also coordinate all donations for, for the, for the re refugees. Uh, Catholic Charities has a tradition of helping those in need. We, that's our mandate. That's what we do. Uh, because we are a local organization, it, it, there are 167 Catholic Charities throughout the United States. But each Catholic Charity works in its own diocese. And we're all independent, but we coordinate each other. As a matter of fact, we had a, uh, our Catholic Charities USA meeting in, in San Diego last week, where we discussed the issue of the Afghan refugees. So. We coordinate by helping each other and by, by working together. And that the experience that we have in working in disaster relief, in, in, in assisting and placing refugees and, and assisting people in, in the homeless. I mean, we work with the homeless, we work with uh, the people that have hunger. We work in different areas that are with the marginalized. We, we have mental health, institute, we, we have housing affordable housing for. So all that experience that Catholic Charities brings, we're, we're bringing it over and offering it to, to help the refugees and co by coordinated volunteers, coordinating donations with Rubicon and Karen Becker, who is uh, here as well. She's the one who who's organizing all of that. Thank you. Are other Catholic Charities um, from Wisconsin and other parts of the country participating in these welcome efforts? Yes, I mean, we're in, in Wisconsin, we have five Catholic charities. We have Catholic Charities Madison in, in Milwaukee, in Green Bay, Superior, and La Crosse. Those are, and we're, we're coordinating the efforts of all five Catholic charities to uh, assist the refugees by and providing volunteers. And all that is, they asked us to, to be the leader of, of, of that group. And that's what we're doing. So we're coordinating the efforts and as well as, uh, uh, the Catholic Church in Iowa, Minnesota, so have asked us to to coordinate the volunteers, and we are preparing the list and working together with the USCCB uh, and with Beth and and for McCoy. Thank you so much. Our last set of questions are for Elizabeth Archer, who is the Morale Wellness and Recreation Lead at Fort McCoy. Thank you for being here. First, what are the activities that USCCB conducts at Fort McCoy? And actually, can you, um, what does the USCCB acronym stand for? USCCB stands for, I knew you were gonna ask me, so I wrote it down, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. So I wanna say something really fast. I've been sitting here, like you probably see me move. I've been so excited to tell you about what's going on at Fort McCoy. So thank you for asking. Um, the activities that we are right now, we have set up, I have my list. We have one legal center, one learning center. In addition to having that learning center that we are setting up, we have three that we are supplying or we're supporting with supplies. We have three women's centers and one sewing center. So let me tell you what those mean. So through Catholic Charities, with Catholic Charities, they send us volunteers every day. So every day we open these different centers. Our legal centers, they address and advise on immigration, on different things. They don't give, um, they help to just navigate through some of the questions that the Afghan population has. Our learning center, we are setting up our first learning center. It's opening tomorrow. We're very excited because we had this idea that we wanted to start teaching some basic English, some conversational English. 
And as we were trying to get this all together, we realized we, that within the community itself at Fumakoi, there have already been two learning centers set up by the Afghan population themselves. They went, they talked to the military guys and they've got keys to a building and they set up their whole organization completely by themselves. They didn't have any supplies, but they brought people in and they started teaching English. So now we have located some of those, those centers that they set up, we're replicating what they've already done and just to provide additional support out at Fort McCoy and then getting supplies to those already that have been set up. Our three women and children centers, our women and children centers, those are the whole objective of the women and children centers is to provide a place for the women to come that is safe, that is separated from the men, and that provides a social atmosphere that allows the women to get out of the barracks and into an area where they can start conversing and talking with each other and maybe feel a little bit of normal. Um, they bring in our women's side of it. So we have an area, we have a long building, the up, what we call the upstairs, the women and children's center is meant for toddler age kids and younger and moms and then single women. They come in grandmas and they all come in and they talk and the kids get a chance to play and we, we offer tea and what has actually started happening in that area of the building are these impromptu study sessions where they'll want to know they'll hold up a rattle and ask what is this or you know though the other day we were singing head shoulders knees and toes to teach all the different body parts uh, it's just a it's it's incredible to walk in and see all these ladies they're you know they're holding babies they're juggling being moms and they are working to to learn our language so that there is better communication between all of us then in our part that we call the downstairs, that's our activities room. That room is really geared towards middle school and elementary age children. We offer inside, we offer puzzles and construction paper and <laughs> think anything um, like YMCA type stuff is what we do. All the arts and crafts, Play-Doh, anything that kind of allows the kids to come together again in a safe space. They get to play together and kind of get away from their parents a little bit and just enjoy being kids. We have a big door that we open in all these centers that leads to our outdoor space. And that outdoor space, we have soccer and volleyball, um, cricket, uh, totally made up games of just throwing things and trying to catch them and kids just running all over the place. We broke out kites about two weeks ago in the safe areas in some of our green spaces. And that was amazing to have these kites out and having these kids flying these kites. Um, you know, it's just what we try to offer is a fun atmosphere where there's a chance to pass some time as they're waiting for all the seriousness of their life that they have to catch up on. So we are the, the time, allowing you to pass the time a little bit more, um, I don't know, happily. Um, our, and then we have a sewing center as well that we just opened up today. And right now we have 19 sewing machines and a lot of fabric and a lot of stuff that goes with sewing. And we bring the women in right now that wanna sew and a guest. And it was a really great experience today. We are going to open it up to some of the men as well. And we're looking at hoping, looking at opening another center because there's just a huge demand for sewing and then looking at doing sewing classes as well. And to come, I'm very excited to talk about some of these things that we're looking to bring in. In those women and children's centers, we're wanting to open the back to make lending libraries. There's a huge ask for books. So we're trying to now get books into these centers that we can pass out to, to the, uh, the Afghan population. Um, oh, and make those into small cultural centers as well. So as people start asking, where should I go? Where should I relocate? We have information on Arizona, on Utah, on California, like all these different places that uh, appeal to our Afghan population. We wanna have information available for them. And then finally, we are looking at opening a men's center that which will focus on a few men activities that uh, we can bring in, uh, chess cards just again it's just fun pastime is what we're trying to offer awesome thank you yeah.
Now you mentioned books. Yes. Are there other kinds of donations that are needed to support the activities that you just mentioned? Well, so we there's been such a tremendous outpour of support when it has come to donations and and in kind items and we have we have a warehouse full of stuff right now that we are just we're going through and it's going out to the community to the Afghan community and it is incredible. I would recommend that for anybody who is looking to give donations to go on to Catholic Charities. They have a, a button there that is to donate and you can do money donations or you can do in-kind donations and the in-kind donations, there's a list that Karen and I go over at least every other day to keep updated and current on to what we actually want in those MWR centers. If you're looking to donate outside of the MWR centers or the women and children centers, I would recommend going to Team Rubicon. They also keep a very updated list on what the population as a whole is looking for. That's where I would get my recommendations. Thank you. And then how are the volunteers that Catholic Charities mobilize is being deployed um, to support the activities that you mentioned? Catholic Charities is the backbone to what we're doing right now with those volunteers. Uh, they come in and so I just telling you all the different activities that we have, each one of those activities requires somebody to oversee them and ensure that the kids are being safe, that they're having fun, that they understand what we're doing. So at any one time you can walk into any one of the centers and I have from five to 10 Catholic charity volunteers in each one of my centers and every single one of them throughout the entire day are surrounded by 10, 20, 30, 60 kids who are just wanting their attention and their compassion and their, their love. Thank you so much. Thank you. So this ends the, um, the presentation portion of tonight. Um, now we'd like to invite you to reflect, take a moment, think about what you heard. If you have any questions, feel free to write those questions on the cards that were on your chair. Once that question is written, go ahead and, and hold that up in the air. Somebody will come by and collect it for you. Um, so take a couple minutes, we'll, we'll pause here for a moment. All right, so we will start the questions now. Feel free to continue to write and they'll collect as we go so we can get as many questions in as we can before we're out of time here. I'm realizing I need reading glasses, folks, so hang on. <laughs> My goodness. All right, what effort? And so now I'm gonna ask the question. Feel free to engage if you feel like you're the right person to answer this, okay? What efforts are being made to ensure the preservation of the Afghan people's culture and to make sure that resettlement efforts do not turn into assimilation. How can we be better than the past and help them while not destroying what connects them to their ancestry? Beth, you wanna address that one or you want me to? Okay. I think the, the first thing is that as Catholic charities, um, that what we, what we do, we do it because we are Catholics, but we don't do it for Catholics. We serve everybody and we work on treating everybody with dignity and respect. And that means their dignity and respect their background, who they are as a person, as a people, as a culture. So we go through tremendous effort in training our volunteers, and in speaking with them, that the, our mission is not to convert or to proselytize or anything. Our mission is to help them to be who they are and to be the best people that they can be. Thank you. Okay, so some of the things that we're doing to offer those pastimes, like let's say sewing, for instance, the idea behind that sewing is to allow these women to make the clothing that feels appropriate for them to wear. So there have been a lot of donations, but sometimes they wanna change those clothes to make it more culturally appropriate for them. 
that's what that's been asked for. So that's what we're trying to do with some of that sewing stuff is just offer, here's a way for you to, to continue feeling comfortable in your own clothes. Um, some of the other things that we do, we offer music that is, um, that's, you know, that it's music that they were listening to at home. So we've reached out and asked, hey, tell us what you wanna to listen to. So we're trying to keep, you know, we're not taking, we're trying not to take anything away from them. And then the other thing actually that we just talked about today are days of importance and how we can, so we were calling them holidays. We were asked to call them days of importance. Um, how can we address those and how can we ensure that those are still being recognized throughout the time that they're here at our, our, our camp? I wanted to just make a couple of additional observations. Um, the first is that if you've ever been to Fort McCoy, as you drive through, you'll notice that there have been some changes. Signage is all in three languages, English, Dari, and Pashto throughout the entire fort, uh, the, the entire living area of our Afghan guests. The food has been, the menus and all of the dining facilities have been completely revamped. They're all halal. And we have Afghan guest advisors who are helping develop and coach our cooks uh, and, and to make sure that we're serving culturally appropriate food that's nutritious and that people will, will enjoy. Um, we've converted um, buildings throughout Fort McCoy as prayer centers divided for men and women. We've received donations from organizations like the Muslim, the Milwaukee Muslim Women's Coalition of prayer rugs, of, of, of traditional women's clothing, um, and of the Holy Quran as well, which are available in those prayer centers. Uh, more broadly, thinking about life beyond Fort McCoy, one of the core tenets of the resettlement process is to look and see where community already exists in the United States, where people want to travel and be. And so what that means is there's a certain kind of preservation of culture and community and family in those places. So when people arrive at Fort McCoy, they have an interview. And during that interview, they say where their cultural ties are, where their support ties may be in the United States. And there's a significant effort to try to locate people where they have support on their own rather than having to rely on volunteers they haven't met before. Um, so of course, not everyone will be able to move somewhere in the United States where there's already established Afghan population. Um, and in those instances, those services that are available in the community where they'll be moving will be known. The last thing I wanted to just mention is that I mentioned there were nine resettlement agencies that are working to um, with local affiliates to um, to accept people into communities. Um, in addition to Catholic Charities, uh, here in La Crosse, Lutheran Social Services is the resettlement agency helping uh, refugees and our Afghan guests here in La Crosse. Uh, but throughout Wisconsin, we also have the International Institute of Wisconsin, the World Relief of the Fox Valley, and Jewish, Jewish Social Service. And so you'll know there's a common theme that religious organizations throughout the United States tend to have the support for refugee resettlement. And I don't think it's by accident. And I think it also shows some of the um, kind of common tenets that we share uh, regardless of faith and also a, a focus on ensuring, uh, again, that people are resettled and, and, and welcomed into communities where they have uh, a connection already to the Afghan community. Thank you. Thank you. That was an excellent question. So thank you, audience. The next one is specifically for Dr. Anthony Tchaikovsky. Um, can you please repeat the stats on how much money refugees contribute to the economy? Sure. So there's been a number of really important research findings on this topic, and I can give you a couple. Um, so in 2017, this is a Department of Health and Human Services study between 2005 and 2014 examining uh, refugees between those years. Between those years, when you compare the amount of government services that refugees consumed versus the amount of tax dollars that refugees paid, they paid 63 billion more in tax dollars compared to the amount of government services that they consume. So it was a net gain for the, the government. Um, uh, other research findings, uh, between 2009 and 2011, the workforce participation of refugees was higher than the workforce participation of people born in the United States. Um, 
A, the Department of Health and Human Services report also found that after 10 years of residence in the United States, those who came here as refugees were about equal to the US population in terms of income and employment status. Um, refugees are a bit more likely to receive nutritional assistance, SNAP, uh, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, um, more commonly known as food stamps. The refugees are a bit more likely to receive nutritional assistance compared to the US population as a whole, but refugees receive cash assistance at the same rate as the broader population. Um, ultimately, the workforce participation and productivity of refugees is so high that a study from the Migration Policy Institute actually expressed concern about refugees having enough time to gain additional education and training that could advance their earnings potential, just given their extraordinary productivity in the workforce. Just how do you find the time to up your skills so you can increase your earnings potential. That was a real concern that was developed quite different than many of the stereotypes about the extravagant use of government resources that, that you might hear on social media or elsewhere. Thank you. This might be for Beth. Um, is there a library for uh, the children and adults at the fort? A library. So there is we are we have books available in the centers that we reread to the kids every day we have interpreters and translators that come in with us and we give a series of books we let the kids pick out which books they want and then they sit and it's read to them in english and then interpreted in pashtu and in dari and um, we do lots of acting out with that and then we allow books to go home with the kids uh, if they want to take them the lending library is new. There are books available, but we haven't labeled it a library until, well, we're doing that. We're in that process of doing that. So um, there's not a library listed out as being there, but there are books available. And anytime any of them ask for a book, anybody asks for a book, we find a book. Thank you. Um, I'd also, can I maybe also just ask please. that the La Crosse Public Library and the Sparta Public Library have donated books um, in addition to some for the children's centers. Uh, we have a population of college-aged women who are among our population, and we've been very grateful for donations of English language books through those libraries and their, their supportive board members to put a small library in their housing as well so that they can continue their studies, if not in person, at least in, in English and and through reading. And that was a request that they had um, that we were able to fulfill with the generosity of the community. Wonderful, thank you. Um, how are mental health needs being addressed? Anybody, anybody can address, address that question? If I might. Um, so this is a really complex topic. And I think it comes back to one of the first questions that you asked as well on how you ensure that we um, approach these kinds of questions in a culturally sensitive way. Um, you know, I'll, I'll speak personally and say that virtually every guest who's arrived at Fort McCoy has been through a tremendous and arduous journey and have some degree of trauma as a result of that. The top concern that I hear people express is concern for the family and the friends and the life's work that they've left behind. The questions they have, even before they ask, where am I going and how will I settle in the United States? They want to know how I can help my family back in Afghanistan. And so it's a, it's a, important question, how you provide the kind of spiritual and, and behavioral and emotional support. We have a behavioral health center at Fort McCoy. It is staffed with um, social workers and counselors. It has staffed with interpreters as well. Some portion of the, um, the practitioners have language, not all. And so we've got uh, professional interpreters providing that service as well. Uh, but I do think it's a, it's a important uh, question. And I think that the need for that kind of service will continue far beyond their time at Fort McCoy. So I come back again to, uh, you know, what resources, what people will need, what support is available for them, um, be it in the schools when they're arriving in their new schools, be it in their neighborhood or in the communities where they settle. And I think that'll be a long-term question for the United States as a country, community by community, uh, as well as what we can provide in kind of this short term and, and um, period of time while they're at Fort McCoy. Thank you. 
How are interpreters being coordinated to provide meaningful access to activities and services at Fort McCoy and beyond, example, um, healthcare services? So we've got a couple of different kinds of interpreters. Um, we've got US Army soldiers who are uh, multilingual who provide interpretation services. We've got um, interpreters who are coming as volunteers with our NGOs, including through the International Rescue Committee, um, supporting the Red Cross as well. They're on, on site until tomorrow when, when they find that finish the emergency operation of which they've been a part. Um, my embassy colleagues who are there uh, from embassy in Kabul are also providing an interpretation. And then we have additional contractors as well, um, mostly through the army who are performing those interpretation services. And I'd also say just really importantly, I, I appreciated Beth's comment about the way that the community itself is organizing and, and providing service to others, even in the moments where people themselves have been uh, completely uprooted, their life is completely unknown looking forward, you still see the sense of service to others. And in one place where we see it, in addition to the kind of nascent schools that have organized or classes that have organized is an interpretation. So if someone speaks English, oftentimes they will step in and help their neighbors in their building who don't solve problems, understand what's happening, um, and approach, you know, approach a soldier on the street to help ask the questions that they may have. So I think it's happening both kind of in a formal way through all of the resources that are available, but, but really importantly, among the community and service to others as well. Thank you. Why aren't there any Afghan evacuees from Fort McCoy here tonight? Today, we had our first of our guests um, speak to the media. And so he spoke to WKOW Channel 8. Um, but, you know, I think um, it's really important to understand that there is um, both a responsibility to be sure that people's privacy and safety is protected. And so um, people have been through a traumatic journey and many of them fear for the safety of their family and the work that they left behind in Afghanistan if their whereabouts were to be known. Um, and secondly, I think we'll see more of the stories of our Afghan guests speaking for themselves, but we're really in, uh, very cognizant of how important it is for that to be something that they find on their own. So a lot of our Afghan guests are on social media in Dari and Pashtu talking about their experience at Fort McCoy. Some of them have reached out directly, including to uh, the local channel, channel eight here as well. And so they're speaking for themselves and we're facilitating where we can when people want to, to share their story. But I think we're also quite cognizant that that has to be on their terms and on their timeline as well after this journey. Um, tomorrow, there'll be a, a media event at, at Fort McCoy and I encourage everyone to, to take a look tomorrow night and thereafter and you'll get to hear from some of our Afghan guests. Thank you. Can I add also, um, I met that at Fort McCoy, the, the correspondent from, for the public radio uh, in Afghanistan, and she's here. I mean, she's not, uh, she's at Fort McCoy right, right now. So there are, there are people who are, are capable of doing that, but they need time. Thank you. Are there Afghans at Fort McCoy who do not have clothing, snacks, shoes at this time? No. Um, no, the answer is, I, I can confidently say, um, nearly everyone has been through the Team Rubicon store, and we saw just kind of in terms of how and who arrived, the people who arrived first at Fort McCoy often arrived only with their backpacks, um, if that, um, but later on as people spent time in other places before Fort McCoy, because nobody came directly from Afghanistan to Fort McCoy or even directly to the United States, they had stops along the way. So um, when they first arrived, the need was acute and people had just the clothes that they had and through the generosity and the coordination of Team Rubicon, as well as the Red Cross, we were able to ensure that everyone had the basic clothing that they needed. Um, the, by all accounts, the food now is delicious and available in the quantities and then kind of on the schedule that people need uh, with kind of the flexibility as well for families who may have mobility challenges because they've got, you know, really small children or, or wheelchair bound parents. Um, we've made accommodations for those families for food as well. I'd welcome anyone else who spent time at Fort McCoy to comment it as well. 
I would agree that I haven't seen anybody that doesn't have um, shoes or that seems not to have be able to get snacks or anything of that sort. Um, yeah, I, I guess. Thank you. Many ev evangelical churches in this area would like to help and welcome these refugees, but are not being given a path. What can be done? You know, I think the, the resettlement process is an important way to offer those resources in a, in a, in a way that um, can connect the need of a community uh, member in, in Fort McCoy with the resources that are available locally. Um, and I know evangelical churches have been extraordinarily generous as well as part of the generosity we've seen more broadly from the community. Holly, I also wonder is that welcome.us, is that a resource for anybody to go on to to see where, where and how you can help? Okay, so welcome.us would be a great place. Are Lisa, there if, if I could add, so another venue, you know, that was a great point about folks still stuck in Afghanistan and often our concern is the folks that are left behind. There are organizations still very much working to help mitigate that and help people get out. And that's noonelef.org and teamamericarelief.org. So if people are interested in helping on that end of the spectrum, um, there are talented and motivated people working day and night to get folks out. They have lists of, of families that still need to get out and dollars um, donated there will absolutely make a difference to those folks that are still stuck. So um, for folks wanting to give and for those organizations, noonelef.org and teamamericarelief.org. And they can also contact Catholic Charities, you know, if they want to volunteer and help, they can contact us Thank through you. our website. Thank you. And I believe I see Team Rubicon, you also have a website, correct? So Team Rubicon would be another website that you can go to to find different ways that you can help. Let's see here. Are there Afghans receiving money? Are they able to shop? And do they have phones? We are, we're not distributing money, but they are able to shop, they have money, and they, they are able to acquire their own things. Now we, through the donations that we receive, we are providing all, all they need. I mean, whatever they need, the, the sewing machines, the fabric, uh, we're purchasing all of those items as well. But yes. Thank you. Will any of the Afghans be ready for college in the next two years? What preparation and assistance would they need to attend a college? So we have college students among our population. Um, we've got young, young women college students who are looking now to, and they're prepared to go to college now uh, to continue their studies. And we also have a number of high school students among our population, and they'll need the same kind of support and services as a lot of college high school students around the United States do to prepare them for high school or for college. Um, schools who receive, um, you know, who have English as a second language programs will be an important resource for those families. And it's the kind of service, again, that through the resettlement process, we'll look to make sure that the needs of the family match the kind of resources that are available um, where, where they'll be resettled. This next question is on terms. Um, can someone speak on um, the terms to use or the language? What is the difference between a refugee, an immigrant, an evacuee, Etc. Are they interchangeable? Um, so I can speak to the terminology we use at Fort McCoy. So um, refugee is literally a person seeking refuge outside of their home country. And so refugee in terms of, and, and kind of a uh, descriptive term is a, an appropriate term. It's not the legal term um, that they would receive refugee benefits yet. That's a decision at a national level that is still under consideration. Um, we refer to our guests collectively as guests um, because their status is different among the population. Um, we have some people who have special immigrant visas in their passport, which entitles them to benefits like um, uh, like a, a like a green card would have. Um, we have others who are haven't started that 
immigration process. So we use collectively the term evacuee for anyone who was evacuated from Afghanistan. We use the term personnel for those who are direct US government employees. So you'll hear people talk about Afghan personnel. What that means is employees of the US government who are now in the United States, as well as they'd be, I guess, personnel if they remained in Afghanistan as well. Um, what other terms do we have we used here tonight? Immigrants. Immigrants. Immigrant, just a, a more broad and general description for someone who migrates from their country into a, a new country. Thank you. This, there's a second part of this. And is there common language we can and should be using? So I think this gets to um, respecting the, our, our guests at Fort McCoy. Um, so this is a very thoughtful question. Like how, how should we be referring to our guests at Fort McCoy when they start to get resettled? I will dare to answer a little bit of that. There are our guests. And I will refer to them as our guests and people who are visiting us and, and, and will be part of our community. I'd also say Afghan is a person, Afghani is a money. So you can say an Afghan person, but you wouldn't say an Afghani person. It's something that I have learned um, through part of this process. and. You know, hopefully we call them like coworker and neighbor and friend and other things as well as they arrive into communities and settle in. Thank you. Roughly what percentage of the people at the fort supported the US in recent years? So uh, kind of, as I said at the beginning, a majority of people at Fort McCoy worked for the United States in a different capacity over the past 20 years, or they are the dependent of one of those people. So, you know, I have an embassy colleague who worked in, in the embassy in Kabul for a number of years as, as a driver, and he's here with his um, seven or eight children. Um, so when you include the family members as well, um, very much a, a majority of people there are either direct, uh, had worked for the United States or how the family member of someone who had, and then you have an additional group of people who were particularly vulnerable for their advocacy or their work uh, on behalf of, uh, you know, a, a democratic system that enfranchised women, or they were women who were known to drive cars as well as part of the work that they had done in promoting development work, and so you kind of have a. a a great deal of diversity therein among the population, both in terms of geography, where they come from in a, Afghanistan is a big and, and diverse country with a number of ethnic groups and languages. Um, so you see diversity among socioeconomic levels as well. But um, again, I would a majority of people there either worked directly for the United States or are their dependents. If I might add, Lisa, like, so not only I think do they work, you know, for us and alongside us, but they supported us in, in matters, you know, great and small. I was there I think two weekends ago and a gentleman, you know, ran up and he had a piece of paper and he told me, look, look, look. So I looked at it and it was a memorandum from random guy like me from like seven or eight years ago saying that this gentleman provided a service and he is of character and standing and whoever reads this should know that. If you think about like the, the gauntlet that he ran through and he kept that piece of paper, he didn't keep it to extract anything from me or to, to let me know that he, he had um, done a service that should be returned. It was to show me that he was faithful that he was faithful and he's here now and look what he did before. Um, and that document to him was worth keeping. So it wasn't services rendered, I think for financial gain or for, for anything um, less than belief in our cause and what we brought to our, our country. So it's, it's, it's commitment, but then also belief and passion. And Lisa, this is relevant to public opinion. Uh, there was a poll that came out two or three weeks ago that had one wording of the question that just asked, do you support or oppose accepting Afghan refugees into the US? That's all the question was. And 60% of Americans said, yes, we support that. But then a different version of the question was asked. And the question that was the second version was, do you support or oppose accepting Afghan refugees if they assisted the US during the war in Afghanistan? 
And with that version of the question, support goes from 60% to 83% support for accepting Afghan evacuees. Now, Lisa, you can't get 83% of Americans to agree on every and on anything. So this is really remarkable, that level of support, once you add that really critical detail into the mix. Thank you. Do refugees receive social security numbers before they leave Fort McCoy? Um, as I said, part of the process of um, kind of intake and preparing someone for resettlement includes an application for an employee authorization document. And that includes uh, the social security card as an identity document as well. I'm looking at my colleagues to confirm that. Is Fort McCoy working with other bases, housing locations to share triumphs and struggles and learn from one another? Yeah, I'm looking, we have, um, you know, concentric circles of coordination among the bases. The military has rare, the army regular calls, the, um, the Department of Homeland Security, the lead federal agency has um, operation wide phone calls, even the State Department, we have our own coordination calls across bases. Uh, because I think what we find is it, 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 it makes sense. We're having the same kinds of challenges depending upon when we started receiving guests kind of on the same general timeline. And so it's been a really important part of the coordination, not only among all of the different respondents, including the folks here um, and in the audience, um, but also to, to kind of learn lessons as well as um, flag you know, for policy making uh, processes, what we're seeing and what kinds of policy decisions will be important to help resettle people um, over the longer term. Thank you. Are there children without parents? How are they being cared for? Are they safe? So we have um, the Department of Health and Human Services is the lead federal agency for unaccompanied children. And we have that agency present on Fort McCoy to respond to exactly that issue to ensure, again, the, the security and the safety and the well being of all of our guests and, of course, children in particular. This question says if we purchase anything online, Target, Walmart, how can we deliver it to Fort McCoy? Through Catholic Charities. You just need to send it to Catholic Charities and we will deliver it. Rubicon, I'm sorry. Thank you. Or Team Rubicon. Right. Thank you. Right. Um, is there any thought, efforts to gather um, or source herbs, familiar foods, or cooking spaces, equipment, supplies uh, for their sensory comfort? So there's no, the uh, food is all provided um, on the base. There are dining halls, which are open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. There are uh, snacks and supplementary items available outside of those hours. Um, but the, the, you know, the, 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 the facilities at Fort McCoy aren't designed, um, if you've ever been in the barracks, for, for kind of cooking in a barrack. Um, but what our guests are doing are advising the menu in those dining facilities um, to be sure that they're culturally appropriate, that they are familiar as well, to be sure that people, you know, are getting nutritious food that they want to eat. Um, but again, this is a temporary stay and they will have many more options uh, when they move into their more permanent resettlement location. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are the evacuees being vaccinated? What is the situation related to COVID on the base at this time? So um, part of the processing that usually happens for immigrants happens overseas. It's part of that process is the routine uh, childhood vaccinations that we all in the United States or most of us receive as, as children. And so um, for guests who need um, those vaccines, they're part of the medical uh, process that they'll have at Fort McCoy. Thank you. Dr. Tchaikovsky, do you have any statistics about businesses by refugees in the US? Uh, yes, 
uh, there, there was some work on this. There were some case studies of this from Cleveland and Columbus that looked at the economic impact of the businesses that have been started by refugees. And in just those two cities, so we're not talking about a large part of the United States, but in just those two cities alone, the economic impact was in well into the millions. Uh, so, you know, e even on the small local scales, the studies that have been done, the, the, the story is clear that the economic impact of refugees is it's absolutely extraordinary. You can see that from the workforce productivity, you can see that from entrepreneurship and businesses, you can see that from basically any angle you take at this issue. Thank you. Do we know any specifics about what the university students on the base are studying? Nursing or any, any fields of study that we know of? I can speak anecdotally. I don't have kind of data on that, but I can tell you of the women that I've spoken to, um, they're studying all fields, including IT, including history, uh, including education. Uh, and so I would say um, we have a, a, a wide spectrum studying nearly every field of study that you would expect in a, in a, um, in a university setting. Thank you. What is the current immigration status of these individuals? Are they automatically granted refugee status? So the, the vast majority of Afghan uh, evacuees come into the United States on humanitarian parole. So they are parolees, they've been paroled into the United States. Uh, uh, some, a portion of them arrived as special immigrants, which is um, a particular kind of immigrant visa for employees of the US government. And like I said before, we've had some people who arrived who were evacuated who were Americans or, or lawful permanent residents who were um, in Kabul and, and um, found themselves uh, caught up in looking for a, a way out. Thank you. So the, I think an important point here is though, everyone who arrived as an Afghan evacuee is in the United States legally. They all have legal status in the United States. Thank you. I think I see another card coming up. That was my last card in my hand. I have one more, but I'll be able to answer this question. So I can grab this one. What is the likelihood of some of the guests being resettled in Southwestern Wisconsin? So there's this great map. The White House published a map uh, almost two weeks ago for the first 37,000 resettled individuals. And the Wisconsin Refugee Resettlement System has capacity as of that date for about 399 people. And they would be resettled through the four organizations I mentioned earlier. And I'll, I went to the University of Minnesota, but I'm from Wisconsin. And I'll note that Minnesota has only been able to provide so far space for 275. So uh, great job, Wisconsin. And I think through the generosity of welcome.us, maybe we'll have uh, an, an updated statistic on that the next time that we meet. Thank you. All right, we are in our final five minutes of tonight's presentation. So what I would like to do now is thank you all for coming. Remind you that this presentation has been recorded. You're able to find it on Viterbo's website. So please, you're welcome to view it again and share it with any of your neighbors and community members that might be interested in reviewing what was learned and discussed tonight. I think you would agree some important information was shared. I have learned a lot. Um, I hope you have too. Um, also, my very last question here is, um, can we as a public expect additional panels and educational experiences such as this one tonight? Well, the Tri-Campus Committee, Western Technical College, Viterbo University, and UW La Crosse is working on that very question. We hope to have one more, we, ha we have another event scheduled on October 19th. We'll get more information about that out to the public as soon as we have all of the details nailed down. We're also working on a third, hopefully before um, uh, before the start of December. So hopefully two more coming your way and we'll do our best to get it publicized so that you all can attend again. So also one more housekeeping note, um, we have a QR code that if you wouldn't mind, we would love for you if you're comfortable to take a quick picture of this QR code, this is a survey. Um, we wanna hear some feedback about what you learned, what you wanna hear more of. Um, 
so that we can continue to provide these types of events for all of you. So thank you all. Please drive safely and be well.